What's up, NBA fans? What's up, all sports fans? This is your boy, JB, host of the Behind the Bench podcast networking channel. Giving a shout out to the rest of that crew. Shy, Kelvin, Jermaine, Kobe Bryant Film Room, Big Dog Talk Sports. That's right, that's right. Everyone who's tuning in, I hope that you support Behind the Bench. Become a subscriber and help make this show the best that it can be. Your support continues to grow and we definitely appreciate it, which means that in the grand scheme, we're definitely doing something right for sure. Now, I want to touch on this briefly. Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers faced the New York Knicks last night in Madison Square Garden, better known as MSG. And the Knicks were shorthanded. They were missing uh, Julius Randle and OG Onanobi. And they fought gallantly until the fourth quarter where they just ran out of consistent offense down the stretch as the Lakers keyed in on Jalen Brunson, slowed him down enough to where the Lakers could take control of the game and eventually uh, clinch the uh, victory. But that's not what I really want to focus on. Now, all of a sudden, and this is where, like, if you really peep game, you can clearly see that See, when they say LeBron James has a lot of power, right? But that's true. But it's not within the framework of his basketball uh, his basketball output it's not based on that it's not based on that it's based on the support and backing from a lot of media voices pertaining to the NBA it's like this two way relationship and they cue off of each other when to try and set the stage for another move that they feel will put him back in an advantageous position to win another championship. See, when you start comparing, and see, when you say that, a lot of supporters will say that you hate it. It's not about hate. It's only hate if you're not, if what you're saying is not true. Everybody can see the stuff of what it is. It's just a handful of people have no problem speaking on it or making it known as to what's going on. That's the only difference. And see, when you start bringing up Michael Jordan, like they've been doing ad nauseum, really over the past, this is 2024, I'm going to say over the past eight to nine seasons, right? What they got to realize is the environment, the climate, the landscape that exists now within the NBA, it never would have took place in any previous decade prior to the super team era because those bold attempts to try to put a superstar in an advantageous position it didn't exist in because the expectation was that that superstar was expected to lead their team that's why the mentality of the NBA superstar then was totally different. Whether they ultimately won a championship or not, the mentality was, 
I'm going to lead my team. And we can go down the line of all the great players that I had an opportunity to watch, it, you know, over time. All of them. Even Magic Johnson, when he was drafted by the Los Angeles Lakers, okay, yes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there. But Magic Johnson became the de facto leader on the court. Not necessarily the captain, because Kareem was known as the captain of the team, but the leader on the court was established pretty much by the time Magic Johnson's rookie year concluded. Same thing with Larry Bird. Same thing with Michael Jordan. Like, what did Michael Jordan say during that uh, Bulls documentary, The Last Dance? He said, during his rookie season, when he started training camp, he said he wanted to identify who the leader was on that team at that time. And he said, I'm going, I'm going at him. I'm not going to do no talking because I have no voice because I'm just starting out. But he let the leader know that he's here to compete at the highest level. Right? We can go down the line. Isaiah Thomas was the leader of the Detroit Pistons. So when they won a first championship, you know, uh, during Isaiah's run and career in Detroit, they hoisted Isaiah Thomas up in the air to acknowledge that he was the leader of the Pistons and he led them to their first championship as a small man. As a six foot one point guard, I should say. So what I'm getting at is, man, something is wrong because now all of a sudden you got these talks ramping up. Now, like I said, as a fan of the Los Angeles Lakers, I want him gone because they've given up too much to pursue winning in a manner that is literally destroying the franchise. Not in a manner that is suitable or feasible or appropriate, but in a manner that's literally destroying the franchise to where even the pundits who now all of a sudden want LeBron James to leave the Los Angeles Lakers and request a trade because they know and realize the Lakers have nothing else left. If they try to make one more move for this guy, it will literally tip the scales, take this franchise, and lead it into oblivion until next decade, which is six years off. The only asset that the Lakers have remaining that they can use, which they shouldn't be thinking about making any more trades, but to facilitate in a trade is a first round pick five years down the line in 2029. That means they are depleted. And people may f forget the New Orleans Pelicans. Let me put it this way. They still owe the New Orleans Pelicans a first-round pick from the Anthony Davis trade where the timeline of their trade don't officially end until 2025. So either the Pelicans can select the Lakers' first-round pick for 2024 this year or defer it out until next year in 2025 to further bolster their roster. So they, can't, they cannot use any draft pick in 2025 because that is – the rights of those picks or that pick is owned by the Pelicans. 
They already used the 2027 first round pick last year and that team overhaul that brought back D'Angelo Russell, who's been subject to trade rumors. So the only draft pick that they have left that they have rights to is five years down the road. That is sad, man, considering all the draft picks that they have used since bringing this dude to the team to facilitate trades to bring in one superstar and then another superstar two years after that. That's why now the pundits out of nowhere, out the box, are pushing for LeBron James to request a trade or for the Lakers to trade him. And see, he got the franchise so bogged down, they can't really catch their breath and operate in a normal fashion or function properly. Now, fans may say, well, the Lakers didn't do nothing in the 2010s. That has nothing to do with right now. And there were circumstances beyond uh, the control of the front office that led to what we saw with the Lakers in decline. And it all stemmed from that Chris Paul trade being blocked in 2011. And it started a domino effect where you had players who were involved in that trade now feeling alienated and would eventually request a trade somewhere else or they, they uh, signed elsewhere within uh, two years time. That put pressure on Kobe Bryant to have to play extended minutes to keep the team afloat where eventually he would injure his Achilles. And once he did that, then the bottom fell out. That's what happened. It wasn't like the front office became inept all of a sudden. A sudden. That's, it's highly exaggerated. It's a misnomer, and it's not true. Were there internal struggles? Yes, but every organization goes through that, even when they're winning. Okay. So now they want him out. And the, the, the destination, the team they want him to go to is once again a team that is rich in assets. And who's that team? Well, in this picture, it's the team whose towel this dude has draped over his shoulders, the New York Knicks. They're looking for the next target. See, it's no different than... When he was playing in Miami, and in those four years he playing in Miami, the Cleveland Cavaliers <laughs> miraculously won the draft lottery three of those years where they earned the number one pick. So they was rich in assets. So when he returns back to Cleveland, he used those assets to begin the process of constructing his second super team. So now the New York Knicks, who have a plethora of first round picks, I believe over 10. So now they're saying he needs to move on from the Lakers, go to the Knicks, where they would be the eyes on favorite to win the title. This has been the same pattern. This has been the same get up for 15 years. It's so redundant. In all actuality, it's played out. It always sounds good. And you may get one. You, you may get the desired result one year. 
but what it's going to cost you to get it you're going to how can I say this you will wind up losing in the end more than you think you're going to win just look at what's going on with the Los Angeles Lakers and like I said this notion that the Lakers operate on a championship or bus mentality is highly exaggerated because after the Los Angeles Lakers won the championship in 1988, after becoming the first team to repeat as champion in 19 years since the 1969 Boston Celtics, the Lakers went 12 seasons without winning a championship. They did not win one championship in a decade of the 90s. They had darn good teams. They had squads, but they didn't win a championship. But the Lakers still didn't mortgage their future way to pursue a winning scenario. Teams didn't even think... If, if, a, if a front office even proposed the idea of hacking away tons of picks to bring in superstars in the stack the deck, they would be relieved of their duty as GM. I guarantee it. Teams didn't even operate like that. And teams didn't start operating like that until the super team era was authored in during the summer of 2010. It all can be traced back to the decision. So now that they see the Lakers running on fumes, because I don't really count these last two games versus uh, the Boston Celtics and the New York Knicks. The team is one game above 500. After all these moves that they've done for this guy, that, that, you know, a lot of his supporters will say, well, they're not doing enough. They've done everything. And then some. They gave up 14 dra drafted players to flip around and bring in every desired player he wanted. They've traded away over 15 draft picks since this whole deal began the summer of 2018. The Lakers, Lakers have mortgaged the way they franchise for this decade. These are all facts. That's why they want him out because they don't want him associated with a team who's about to flounder. Outside of one season in 2020, they have a losing percentage cumulatively prior to that season and since the season of 2020. Those are unequivocal facts. If the Lakers finish the season 45 wins, 37 losses, that's eight games over 500. After six seasons, they would be breaking even at 500. After all they've given up, that's what you call selling yourself short. So now they see the Knicks. They didn't anticipate the Knicks being uh, not just good this season, but improving this season. They didn't see that coming. So now they're focusing on the Knicks and saying, oh, man, they're rich in assets. They got a star player, Jalen Brunson. They, they got another uh, uh, high-level player in OG Onanobi. Man, we could trade uh, uh, Randall and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a boatload of picks, bring in LeBron James, and then they can bring in another superstar. And voila, you got another uh, stack deck for him to, to try to win another championship. It's a very cheap way 
to pursue winning. I'm sorry, man. You see all these other superstars out here, even Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan, as a rookie, he had all the fundamentals. That's why they call it. That's why Sha uh, Shaquille O'Neal referred to Tim Duncan as the big, big fundamentals. Tim Duncan, he played four years at Wake Forest, and he gets drafted by the San Antonio Spurs, who had been kind of struggling uh, for a couple of seasons prior. Even when they had David Robinson um, as their lead player, he was the, he was their franchise player for about ten years. But David Robinson, um, he was kind of started dealing with some injuries or whatnot, and San Antonio Spurs were kind of in flux for a minute. You draft Tim Duncan, and then in his second season, he leads them to a championship, and he plays his whole career with the San Antonio Spurs, right? But he still had to go through the grind every year, though. They were trying to stack the deck for Tim Duncan every year. Now, they would draft two additional players, you know, four years down the road, and, and Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili, who became fixtures and cornerstones of the franchise. But, but like I said, th 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 that's three players. Whenever they fell short... Tim Duncan wasn't talking about, well, get rid of this guy, get rid of that guy. We got to bring another superstar. No, he just they just dust themselves off and came back the next season and tried to do it again. Dirk Nowitzki, they weren't stacking the deck for Dirk Nowitzki every year. It took him 13 seasons before he won his first championship, well, before he won the championship, his only championship. But he had to persevere, he had to go through the grind. That's why when he won, so many fans were happy for him, even if they were not a fan of of the Dallas Mavericks. And see, this is what his fans don't understand. This is what he's missing out on. When Steph Curry won a championship two years ago for the Golden State Warriors, he won his fourth championship uh, uh, versus the Boston Celtics. And he realized how much he persevered those two years prior when Golden State had a real bad season in 2020 after uh, Kevin Durant left and went uh, to go play for the Brooklyn Nets, and they were dealing with all them injuries, and I think they only won like 15 games that year. And then they they retooled and rebuilt, made key moves and, and, and uh, drafted key players, and he led them to the championship with uh, no no super squad. Man, he was so overcome with emotion, man, and, and just the struggle to get there and realize he's about to become a champion in that fashion, and the tears flowed, man. The tears flow, and you love, that's what you love seeing, man. That's what you love seeing. Michael Jordan, all, you know, the struggle he had to endure. The, 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 the tough playoff battles between the, uh, the Chicago Bulls and the Detroit Pistons. So when he broke through and won his first championship, man, he, he was just so overcome, man. He just, you know, he, he let it all out, man. He was crying and all that stuff, man. And it was just a beautiful thing, man. That's what he's missing. Even Kobe Bryant, after Shaquille, uh, uh, nothing was handed to Kobe Bryant. He had to uh, uh, back Eddie Jones at the two-guard spot for two years before he was promoted to the starting uh, position uh, at the two-guard. Shaquille O'Neal get traded in 2004, and he went through a five-year struggle to return back to the top. So when he won a championship in 2009, man, like, man, you love that. Because you knew how hard Kobe Bryant had to, to, to fight to get back to the top. This is what this guy's missing. This is what this guy's missing. And this is what his fans don't understand. So when you bring up a Michael Jordan, man, and, and you look at his resume and you say six finals, Six championships, six MVPs, no losses. There's no comparison. They didn't do all that for Michael Jordan to win. He worked with who the Bulls decide to bring in. And it didn't happen overnight. When they brought in Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant, it took them four seasons. And in between time, Jordan was not saying, man, we need to get a superstar up in here. 
No. He didn't take no shortcuts. This is why this guy gets so much criticism, because any hint of resistance. You had a guy who, who was. Covering the game last night, post game, he said, basically, LeBron needs to to leave the Lakers because the Western Conference is getting too strong. Whoa. Wait a minute. They say, then all of a sudden he say, like I said, I have no, I, I love what the New York Knicks is doing in building their team. I love it. But they're, they're looking to target them to exploit to help this dude win another title. So they say, the person said, well, the New York Knicks got the deepest roster in the league. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Didn't they just say that about the Lakers? In response to the offseason moves that they made prior to the start of this season? I mean, man, it, when you really think about it, man, it's a head scratcher. They'll say one thing five months prior, and then when they see the results, then they take their pronostication and act like they never said it. So here we go. And the thing about it is somebody that has these major platforms, they're not reading the temperature in the room. They're not really peeping the landscape. See, the problem is <laughs> you never know who's going to strike until they do a lot of times. When he went back to Cleveland, formed that super team, because that was a super team in Cleveland. That was a super team. They thought that he was going to run the table again. But they never saw Golden State coming. They didn't see Golden State in their back mirror until they hit. See, the plan always sounds good, but they never foresee other circumstances that is soon to follow. And that's the flaw in trying to create a shortcut for this guy to win. Because that's what's happening. And it's been that's what's been happening for, for who knows, God knows how long. So they was like, man, he needs to get out of the West because they didn't see OKC rise to the top of the uh, Western Conference uh, so far this season. They didn't see Minnesota. They thought, they thought Minnesota was a fluke. Because they lost, you know, they've lost in the first round the past two playoffs. But sooner or later, they're going to improve once they get their chemistry uh, down pat and boom. Here they go. The Timberwolves and the, the uh, Thunder are top of first place. Denver, I believe, was a half a game out as the defending champion. And then you got the Clippers. Sacramento, 10 games over 500. All these other teams can function. With less overhaul, but the Lakers continue to struggle with this dude on the team. It's because the formula isn't feasible. That's the, that's the problem. So here they go again, man, right on schedule. It's the same formula time after time after time. At the time again. They have to move mountains, man. To put this guy in position to win. And it is what it is, man. If this was anybody else they was doing that for, then the focus would be on that player. The conversation would be on that player. They not saying anything about Steph Curry need help. Nothing. And I'm not necessarily saying they're supposed to. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying all of this is abnormal. But they want to bring up Jordan. 
They want to bring up he had Scottie Pippen. Well, think about it. If he's traded to New York, well, he'll be playing with another guy who's getting 26, 27 a game in Jalen Brunson. Michael Jordan, during the championship run in Chicago, never had a guy who was a career 20-point-per-game scorer. Scottie Pippen was a career 16-point-per-game scorer. Now, he had seasons, about like three seasons, during that run where he did average 20 a game. But a lot of times during the playoff runs, particularly uh, in uh, 97, 98, he was averaging less than 20 points. But Jordan was still coming out on top. And it's because his approach to the game that highlighted the fact that he never took one single shortcut while he played. From his rookie year up until the point where he retired in 98 for the Chicago Bulls. He didn't take one shortcut. I'm talking about practice habits, uh, the way he played offense, the way he played defense, leadership, leading his teammates, making sure they was ready to go. He won more with less in a shorter period of time. It's astounding, man. It's astounding. So, like I said, they ready for this guy to leave because there's nothing else that the Lakers can do. Because if they made one more move, it will break the franchise for the rest of the decade. They behind, they behind the eight ball now. Before all this started, it was headed to curve. I can just imagine, because I, I, I've had opportunity to watch basketball for a very long time. I can just imagine where the Los Angeles Lakers would be right now if they stayed the course with their real players. They wouldn't be one game over 500. I can guarantee you that. At worst, they'd be a top three seed. Every year, they would be on a low end, a top three seed in the West every year. That's on the low end. So you notice how, because, I, you know, there's always margin for error, give or take one or two spots. On the low end, they'd be a number three seed consistently. And you constantly drafting your uh, more, more talent to the team. And you can sign a, a free agent here and there. To, to fill a void, particularly on the second unit, they ain't no biggie. That's what free. That's really what free agency is for. Free agency really is not designed for superstars to jump ship, or for superstars to join forces. Free agency was never intended for that. Free agency was intended. I'm talking about like when 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 free agency was fought for in the late '60s. It was done so. Not to stack the deck and manipulate the system, but to maximize your earning potential based on your performance, you know, through our uh, duration of your, your previous contract. Because a lot of players back then were lowballed and were not uh, earning what they uh, deserved based on their performance. That's why free agency was uh, 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 implemented in sports. Not to stack the deck. It wasn't really designed for superstars to, to, to leave. It was to maximize earning potential. So what I'm trying to say is, man, in, in closing, this is getting played out, man. And, 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 and to insinuate or suggest that, that the Los Angeles Lakers haven't done enough, they have done so much to where... They have set themselves back to such a degree to where if they make one more move, it would tip, tip the scales and they would be led into oblivion. That's going into the next decade. To where they can finally move beyond this. Because in the meantime, they're not going to be able to draft no players. They've given up all their draft picks. I'm talking about, when I say drafting players, I'm talking about Drafting the best available player that they can. We 
What if five years from now you got the next uh, uh, phenom into the NBA draft? Well, if the Lakers make, uh, trade that pick now, they, they not even giving themselves an opportunity to be, be in position to draft uh, such a player. See, this is why you got to think long term. And you can still prepare for each season and be competitive and maintain a high standard of play. But to mortgage yourself off of one season like that, that that that, that wouldn't even have been a, a, a consideration in, in decades prior. It wouldn't even be a consideration. That's why teams establish themselves as dynasties or the teams that did establish themselves as dynasties. They thought differently. They matter of fact, well, <laughs> There was nothing else to compare the thought process to because organizations back then were trying to establish themselves and become mainstays. And they knew the only way they can do that is to uh, carry out a long-term vision. That's why the Boston Celtics became the, the team of the, uh, the uh, 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 dynasty in the team, the team of the 60s. And I'm talking about other sports too, football, baseball. I'm telling you, man, something is wrong. Something is wrong. And it, it, you sit there, you, you jostle, you know, you, you know, uh, you, you uh, uh, pick in pride. You gouge out your franchise. And you still don't come up with the results. Because truth be told, for all the moves that the Lakers have done over the past five and a half seasons, realistically, bringing in one superstar to two years later, bringing in another superstar, and all these top 75 players that they'd roll through the pipe, shooters, big shot blockers, wings, this team should have been the number one seed in the West every year. Something is wrong. But it don't surprise me because I've been seeing the same get up for 15 years. And realistically, when you get down to it, this guy should have 10 championships, not 10 finals appearances. Because the objective is if you reach your finals, that means your team is good enough to win it. Just like in the Super Bowl. Then it comes down to who's superstar going to play better. Realistically, this guy, they have tried to set it up to where this guy win 10 championships. I've never seen nothing like it. I just want to drop that nugget. Until next time, this is JB for BTB Behind the Bench.